So, um, I'm going to tell one story, which is a story of how Seattle started to tackle the affordability crisis. Take from it what you will. I don't claim to have all the answers, but we figured some things out that we like, and we're still struggling and still figuring out. But I wanted to share this story as adding one piece to the puzzle. I know there's been a lot of good conversations here, and hope this adds some more light. Uh, in 2015, we knew we had to address housing affordability. We knew because Seattle's one of the cities with the fastest rising rent because we had almost 3,000 homeless on the street, because we had 45,000 people who were severely rent burdened. And unfortunately, these are numbers in the city that is actually already a leader in affordable housing. We were the first in the country to pass an affordable housing levy. And through five renewals over 35 years, we've taxed ourselves and built 12,000 units of affordable housing and for seniors, low wage income, low wage earners, and formerly homeless. We've provided a property tax exemption to uh, developers who provide workforce housing. We've had voluntary incentive zoning, which if people are, want to build greater height, they either build inside in the buildings uh, affordable units, or they pay us a fee. But this has only been in a few areas and focused in downtown. And even though we're building 700 units a year through these things, which makes us pretty good per capita in terms of affordable housing, it's not enough. We knew that even more, and we knew that even more than the minimum wage, this was going to be complex. This was a polarizing debate. We've seen years, decades of battles between the advocates calling for more requirements and the developers suing in response. Something had to be done. There was an idea that was moving fast. It was called mandatory linkage fee, which I think many cities here have on all the developments. It was galvanizing Seattle. Advocates have been building a campaign for years. And at the same time, developers had started to gather, and it's put tens and hundreds of thousands into a legal fund to sue. We didn't have press in Washington State, so we knew one, just this thing even happened wasn't going to be enough, and two, there was a good chance we'd face three to five years of legal battles and end up with nothing to show at the end of it. So we weren't quite willing to take that risk. So what did we do? We pulled out our playbook from the minimum wage, and we got people together in a group that became known as the Housing Affordability and Livability Agenda or HALA, 28 people. You got the tenant advocates, housing advocates, developers, service providers, landlords, put them in a room. We want some new voices, so we put in some environmentalists and educators, major employers. We knew this was gonna be tough. Even the HALA report says, each interest group was politically powerful enough to block any single side of proposal. It become a true Gordian knot. And we gave the group a challenge. Develop a list of recommendations that in a decade will produce 50,000 new units, including 20,000 affordable units. This two-part goal was crucial to our success. We strongly believe that in simply increasing supply, build more, 50,000 units, was essential and something we'd never done in a decade. And it was essential to bringing the private sector along to say, we know you have to build more and we're going to help make that happen. But we also knew that in an economically thriving place, the land-constrained city, the market alone was never going to produce enough affordable units, and so we had to have that goal as well. And that was an audacious goal. It was three times what we've done on average per year. Didn't know how we were going to do it, but we said, let's go find a way. And we told them there was no right answer. Everything was on the table. In over six months, the Holly Group met in small groups, met in large groups, they had working groups, online surveys, we looked at zoning, tenant protections, construction practices, and the result was far-reaching 64 solutions. As a council member uh, in our area likes to say, there may, no be, may not be any silver bullet, but there might be silver buckshot, so we tried them all. <laughs> um, we included new big ideas. Let's go to Olympia and develop a property tax exemption for the preservation of market affordable units a key element of our uh, displacement strategy. And I'm happy to say it's passed out of the Senate and we did great success in the House. Um, let's remove barriers to the mother-in-law apartments and the backyard cottages, which will increase density in the, in the single family zones. You know, let's double, the, they include ideas for more resources. Let's double the housing levy. Let's raise the real estate excise tax. They included wonky and technical ideas, like changing the code to allow more prefab construction or see what's possible with cross-laminated timber. Something there for everybody. We had ideas steeped in social justice. Let's look at the barriers for ex-offenders. Let's explore how to get the private sector to develop a Sharia-compliant financing product. 
They include land use ideas. Let's look at the parking requirements and see how those can be lowered to lower construction costs. Let's look where buildings can be taller along transit corridors, near jobs, or in transition areas. And so while we've reached a consensus on 64 ideas, all crucial, we are still stuck. Possibly the most important and the polarizing issue. How do you get new development to help contribute to new affordable housing? We were so stuck, actually, that we decided we couldn't keep moving forward as a group of 28. Building that group was important, but it was too raw, too technical, too complicated to have as a group discussion. So we broke into an even smaller group to work on this. And the advocates came with the table demanding a minimum number of housing units. Let's see and make sure it gets results. Developers came with a value proposition. They're willing to get more, willing to talk about fees, but they want to be able to build more as well. And let me be clear, we knew in these negotiations at some point, the mayor liked to say, it would come off the rails, the wheels would fall off, and sure enough, they did. There were days when the developers threatened to walk because a math correction, even though we were following the process they agreed to, raised the rate by a few dollars. There were days when the advocates got scared and threatened to walk because the idea of exceptions were going to swallow the whole. But in fairness, you really can't raise height of buildings that are in the flight path of seaplanes. So we had to find a balance. There were days where we simply left the table because we had nothing new to say. But we kept working it, and we kept coming back. And we finally got there. The result was our 65th idea, the grand bargain, which allowed developers to build another one or two floors in all of the urban villages and the multifamily areas across the city in exchange for a new requirement of inclusionary zoning or commercial linkage fees that include affordable apartments. This was a sweeping citywide proposal, upzoning all of these areas in a way that had never been done before. It was a big risk. It involved, it involved admitting we'd made mistakes before. We'd allowed growth to happen without affordability built in. But for the first time, anyone who's going to build new multifamily housing or commercial development will include units or pay into a fund. And for the first time, we had developers and housing, and, uh, sorry, developers and affordable housing advocates on the same page. That's significant. After two decades of fighting, we had a nascent partnership that's hard to form. But that wasn't enough. If we're going to get this to work, we had to expand and include more people. So we worked hard to build the coalition. We're including labor voices at the, as advocates for more workforce housing. We've included environmental groups. Because you know, while greater recycling and more solar are important, some of the most fundamental environmental work we're doing is providing equitable and sustainable neighborhoods with affordable housing in our urban villages near jobs and transit. Almost nothing else we do is going to matter more to control emissions. And we're, and we're working to engage the tech community whose employees have a workforce that wants this density, but employees have not traditionally been engaged in the political discourse. If they're silent, they're not going to get their wish. So we formed this larger coalition to build support across the city as we enter this two-year process of doing the zoning changes necessary. And, and the breadth of this coalition is important. I need to be real here. There's a challenge in getting the neighborhoods to agree to this. That building trust with residents that this zoning is a part of getting affordability right is necessary. And it's not going to be easy. We need to motivate the voices. We need to include the homeowners, but we need to be, move beyond the professional citizen activists, the usual suspects who come at every community meeting in the evening. So it takes a new techniques. It means, you know, we've done a telephone town halls where we have a thousand people in each town hall. And when we asked, 70% of the people had never been involved in any community meeting or city event. So we need new voices there. Online forums, small forums, living room chats, everything we can do. Um, it means getting growth right. We passed the biggest transportation level we ever had, and we've redesigned our planning process to build sustainable urban neighborhoods where we can put jobs, transit, affordable housing in one place. Quickly, how do we do it? Four elements of success. First, we assembled the right people. The group had people who were authentic voices at the corner, no pushovers, but we had reasonable middle, and we had new voices who could give new perspective. Second, we worked off data. Everyone came with their two data facts that proved their point. We needed good data, create a shared understanding. This is the problem, and we all know it. Third, we made clear that nothing was off the table, and we we're open to all ideas. Fourth, we set a goal, and we had a deadline. And we told people, if you didn't come to a consensus, 
the city was going to come up with its own, and you might not like it. Got them to come up with an idea. As one of them used to say, I need to know when midnight is so I can know when I can make my last concession. We got them there. Old Abraham. Finally, it's important that we have advocates at the table who are going to push their constituencies as we move. A real breakthrough is going to take real concessions from both sides. It's going to take new realities from both sides. And if you're not at the table and you're not knowing about those changes, at the end you're going to say, wait, I could have gotten a better deal. So as the people are in the room, part of their job is to go home and tell people what's happening, to tell people where the conversation is, so when the next move happens, they understand and have been brought through the process. We have more work to do now to bring the whole city along on this. Um, but we're going to keep doing it through all the outreach I said and seeing what, the, what this new Seattle looks like that's affordable for all. So stay tuned. I hope next time I come to you, I can bring more stories of building a Seattle that's affordable.